recognize uh, a right to food, mm -hmm. good food, food that will keep us healthy, food that uh, uh, is not changed uh, uh, chemically, uh, but that, that occurs naturally, which is what our bodies are ready to receive and will keep us uh, healthy. So uh, I uh, wholeheartedly support my friend, uh, Representative Hickman, and all of you in support of this important resolution, uh, most fundamental resolution. And, uh, and uh, so those are essentially my submissions. And I thank the representative for bringing this forward to, for all of us to talk about. I believe we're prepared to answer any questions you may have. Representative, are you panel, any questions for Representative Bear? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Yes, we do have another representative here. Please step forward and apologize for not knowing your name, but that's what. There's 151 representatives in our house. And sometimes it's hard to know your name. Good afternoon, Senator Edgecombe, Representative Hickman, distinguished members of the Joint Senate Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Matthew Dana II. I represent the Passamaquoddy Tribe. I'm here to testify in favor of LD 783. <clears throat> the traditional practice of the Passamaquoddy people was to hunt, fish, gather, and grow our own food. Today, many of those practices still continue, although our rights to carry on some of these practices have been restricted by state regulation. We understand the importance of securing the right to food and to acquire food that individuals own nourishment and sustenance. <clears throat> My ancestors have always fought for the continuance of our traditional practices and the right to feed ourselves. They had made sure our rights were guaranteed in our treaties, and then again in 1980 with the Maine Land Claim Settlement Act and the Maine Implementing Act. The right to barter, trade, or purchase from sources of that individual's own choosing, and every individual is fully responsible for the exercise of this right, which may not be infringed, is also important to the tribe. Our economy was once based on trading and bartering before European contact. We now have to adapt to the modern economy and sell our harvested resources for money. For example, the passport of people now sell our eel harvest to provide for our families instead of eating our catch. When Representative Hickman was speaking, it reminded me of our ceremonies, and after our ceremonies, we have a feast. And in this feast, we always have food that we've always harvested, moose, deer, salmon, fish, berries, fiddlets. It's all stuff we've taken from the earth. So I fully support this constitutional amendment and hope that you vote on to pass. Well, thank you for your time, and happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Uh, thank you, Representative Dana. Uh, does uh, Peter Dana Point have any reflection on your family or any connection? I That's think. where I live. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I know right where the road is. I've been by there many times. I've never been up to the point. It's beautiful. Is, is it on a lake? It is. It's on the uh, the corner of Big Lake, at the intersection of Big Lake and Long Lake. Mm -hmm. People have lived there for thousands of years. I welcome you to visit at any time. Oh, thank you. Is there any uh, significance of your bolo tie that you have? This is an owl. Um, it's one of my uh, great 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 grandfathers, Thomas Joseph, was a, a, a guide for Roosevelt out of the Camp Bernalo Island. Mm -hmm. uh, when he did a lot of his birch bark etching, he signed it with an owl. Oh, thank you. I appreciate knowing those uh, tidbits of uh, history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for testifying as, as well. Uh, any other legislators present? Joe Salatin from Holly Face Farm who has come to us direct from the gym. Well, I hope uh, spring is settled in down there. Yes, it's just a little ahead ahead of you all. <laughs> just a little, not much. I will give a copy of this when I'm done, if that's okay. Um, I've just gotten off from Australia, so I haven't had a chance to get to things. 
Senator Edgecombe, Representative Hickman, and other distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Joel Salatin from Virginia, and I'm here to testify in favor of LD 783, a constitutional amendment to establish a right to food. I'm a farmer, eater, and more importantly, custodian of three trillion member internal community of bacterial beings energizing my personhood. <laughs> the only reason the founders of our great republic did not include food rights alongside the right to bear arms, to speak, and to worship was because no one at that time could have envisioned a day when citizens could not acquire the food of their choice from the source of their choice. Prior to fairly modern times, people depended on their communities for food. Production, preserving, processing, and packaging were all done in a fairly transparent relational transaction. Shoddy participants experienced community censure to maintain hygiene and standards. With the rise of the industrial food system, this accountability by the commons was replaced by governmental administrative bureaucracy. An opaque industrial food system created a desire in the culture for oversight. That oversight has arguably become just as opaque and industrial as the entity it was created to police. Instead of consenting adults voluntarily self-actualizing their decision-making freedom to private contract, regulators began defining and manipulating food commerce. Large industrial food businesses curried favor with regulators and politicians who empowered them. Gradually, an unholy alliance between industrial food and farm enterprises and the regulatory fraternity, encouraged by an increasingly paranoid, ignorant, and disenfranchised consuming populace, demonized, marginalized, and criminalized historic freedom of choice through the food commons. Butter and lard were out. Hydrogenated vegetable oil was in. Raw milk was out. Coke and Mountain Dew were in. Homemade quiche was out. Microwavable Hot Pockets with unpronounceable ingredients were in. As the official USDA food pyramid wreaks its havoc on the population by encouraging carbohydrates and empty calories, many citizens realize government-sanctioned food and farming bankrupt our health and wellness. Many of us yearn to opt out of this enslaving orthodoxy. We prefer homemade anything, knowing our farmers, loving compost piles, animals that don't do drugs, and acquiring most of our food from sources we vet through personal knowledge or the scuttlebutt wafting through the commons. But to our dismay, we found our choices blocked. We can't buy the wholesome quiche from our neighbor. In order to sell me her unadulterated small ingredient quiche, she must capitalize a commercial kitchen and navigate a labyrinth of licenses, compliances, and infrastructure. The result is that my government denies me the freedom to purchase food through my commons. I can't exercise freedom of choice. I must depend on administrator regulators to determine my body's fuel. I can't imagine a more basic human right, a more bipartisan issue than protecting my right to choose my body's food. Who could possibly think that such freedom of choice should be denied. Excuse me, Joel, but um, we're out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions from the committee? Uh, Senator Dill. If, okay, if that's correct, could you please use the clock? The clock was not running. Oh, yeah, no, that's not running. It was not running here. And I was watching the clock. It was. Not, I had one more paragraph. I had timed this. Check that front? But, but I did not see, it, it was not, it, I was watching for it, but it was not running. Okay, just for a hold of a second. Uh, Cassie, start the clock and see what. Is it running? Yeah. It's running now. But it wasn't. No, it wasn't running. Uh, well, it was I, running? Yeah. Was it? Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I must not have looked at it when it started then. Okay, um, fair enough, fair enough. Well, I'm an old college debater. I, 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 I think maybe uh, if it wasn't running, it was to your benefit. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Senator Bill. I have uh, two questions, if I may. Mm -hmm. The first question is, what's your final paragraph? <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> Thank you. We allow people to smoke, shoot, preach, home educate, spray their yards with chemicals, buy lottery tickets, and read about the Kardashians. Which do you think we can let people choose their food? It is time to give us back the food freedom our ancestors enjoyed. It's time for us to embrace the innovation and food security solutions of granting a fundamental right to food and ginger. You've been gracious to let me address you this afternoon. Now please do the right thing and vote yes on LD 783. Okay, any further questions? Uh, uh, right after uh, Representative Sauce here and then right. Senator Dill will follow. Okay. Uh, Senator Dill. Thank you. There's a lot of issues around uh, foodborne illnesses and, and that type of thing. How do you see that issue fitting in here, whether it be a, a small farm or whether it be a big, you know, conglomerate? Yes, sir. Uh, absolutely. That is the, cru the crucial issue here. And, um, and I would suggest that the inherent safeties that occur in direct producer-consumer relationship commerce is certainly as accountable a, a safety measure as a, an administrative bureaucracy. In fact, the food recalls, uh, the, the, the problems we've had, you know, Campylobacter, Listeria, I mean, we can go down the list, but the, the issues that we've had have been primarily as a result of slippages in the industrial food system and its safety net of, of, of licensing, not farmers markets, neighbor to neighbor food commerce, those kinds of things. And, um, and I would suggest that, that the, the community-based neighbor to neighbor uh, commerce that this encourages um, creates its own safety inherently just because of the size, dimension, scope, and relationship of the transaction. Not to mention, yes, there will be dirty farmers, there will be dirty food. There, this is not paradise. I can't promise you that nobody will ever get bad food. I would like to see somebody defend the fact of industrial food and that nobody's getting bad food today. It's almost as if, well, as long as it kills you slow, it's okay. If it kills you fast, it's bad, and um, and I would just suggest that we have to we have to we have to carve out a place for the for the the heretics the unorthodox to be able to to to, to create their own tribe, if you will, to play around with alternatives to the orthodoxy of our current system. Representative Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here. Um, familiar with your work. I've tried to incorporate some of it on my own farm. Um, thank you for what, for what you do and for taking time to be here today. Thank you. Um, do you think that, or what's your opinion about, we have supermarkets and, and uh, we have uh, stores with all kinds of, all kinds of food, uh, organic and all natural and, and all kinds of food. Do you think that we have adequate uh, food available to us? Uh, no. Uh, that's, thank you for the question. It's a great question. And, um, you know, yeah, you go into the supermarket, you look at all those aisles and you think, choice. You know, who doesn't have choice? But the truth is that much of the, the, much of the choice that many of us would like, whether it's, you know, homemade quiche, homemade charcuterie, um, uh, you know, dairy products, backyard chickens, whatever, um, there are many things that aren't there, and the fact is that the supermarket, the supermarket system, um, is is a very narrow, is a very narrowly accessed system from good agricultural practice that insurance companies are requiring, good agricultural practice. I th everybody knows what I'm talking about. Gap, Gap certified. Um, many insurance companies will not allow uh, shelf space to ungap certified well gap certified is not friendly to compost piles it's not friendly to wildlife in my garden patch um, it's not friendly to um, you know to to cottage to cottage industry kind of thing community based uh, kind of things and so there is a there is a narrow window of access uh, essentially the supermarket um, much of it is simply, you know, reconfigurations of, of corn and soybeans, 
and there's not a lot of choice there. So, um, so I eat, if I could figure out how to um, get alternative, you know, toilet paper and Kleenex, I could about not go to the supermarket anymore. We, we go to farmers, we go to friends for the things that we don't grow and buy our own food. And um, we like being able to walk onto somebody's premises, you know, with a, with a, a transparent open door policy and uh, self-vet, self-inspect. That's not for everybody. And this bill does nothing to discourage government sanctioned food, supermarket shopping, or anything like that. It simply protects what I call the innovative weirdo fringe. <laughs> and, and if we're going to preserve food innovation and integrated food security so that we don't have food deserts, so that we, so that we actual, actually embrace neighbor-to-neighbor neighbor commerce using vacant lots in, in food deserts and, 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 and encouraging uh, entrepreneurial embryonic uh, um, food businesses, we have to offer a place of food commerce access for people who don't have the means or the capacity to buy $100,000 worth of stainless steel and comply with five licenses from a bureaucracy that they can't contact and, 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 uh, and that basically holds them as hostages. Uh, if you irritate the food inspector, you know, I co-own a federal inspected slaughterhouse down in Harrisonburg. It's a small slaughterhouse. We have 18 employees. But the, the level of fear that we live in every day when the badge walks in the door, knowing that that for any reason, um, you know, we uh, we can lose our business, and this has happened several times. Um, it's it's uh, it's quite disconcerting. So if we actually opened up access to neighbor to neighbor food commerce, an explosion of entrepreneurial um, in, uh, community based integrated food security would would blossom and it would really offer choices that you and I can't even envision today. But I think choice would be a good thing. It's similar to, for example, homeschooling laws 35 years ago when homeschooling was demonized and criminalized um, to create a place of, of germination for the homeschooling movement to, to go. Even the most ardent detractor of homeschooling today would say we're probably a richer culture because we enable homeschooling to proliferate. And I would say that we're a richer culture if we allow the level of diversity and decentralization and creativity that, that freedom of choice engenders. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony, thank gentlemen. You. Have an excellent trip home. Thank you. Right. On deck, while Mr. Olson comes to the mic, we will have Monty Preston, Heather Redberg, Alan Loberg, and Ryan Jones. <laughs> Senator Edgecombe, Representative Hickman, and members of the Agriculture Conservation and Forestry Committee. My name is John Olson. I am the Executive Secretary of the Maine Farm Bureau Association, the state's largest general farm organization. Maine Farm Bureau is here to oppose LD 783, a resolution proposing an amendment to the Constitution of Maine to establish the right to food. food. As some of you probably know, I'm an ordained minister, and I serve at the North Wayne Church. Each year during the Christmas Eve service, there is a special offering taken for the pastor's discretionary fund to be used to help people in need. I also volunteer at the local food pantry in Mount Vernon each Saturday. I have seen many people who are hungry and concerned that there is enough food to feed their families. I've given money to people to buy groceries and money for gasoline so they can drive to the grocery store. I do not know how the enactment of this bill will help the many poor people that I serve. What they need is food. It's not necessarily a statement that they have a natural and inalienable right to food. 
In this bill, individuals will have the right to acquire food by, among other things, gathering and foraging. These terms are ambiguous. Does this mean that hungry people can go to a farm or garden and gather vegetables to satisfy their hunger? I can't imagine that any of the people that I minister will do this. Their pride will not allow it. <clears throat> I'm pleased what Maine farmers are doing to help alleviate hunger. Many farmers donate produce they grow to their local food banks in the Good Shepherd Food Bank. Others will give their produce to their neighbors and who are hungry and in need. These efforts, I feel, will do more to satisfy hunger than a constitutional amendment will. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions that I may have. Any questions for Mr. Olson? Um, Representative Chapman. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Olson. A quick question. You're welcome. Thank you. Do you uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand whether your testimony is suggesting that passage of this bill would uh, exacerbate a hunger problem. And if so, uh, if you could clarify how that would happen. I know. I, uh, what I intended to say is that this amendment uh, will really not alleviate hunger in the state of Maine. We need to focus on providing more food for, for the people that are hungry. And uh, that's that's what I think we should do. Thank you. And and, and also, if the if the committee does go forward with this, just the terminology of of, of what it does it mean to gather, that was in our discussion a big uh, a big topic. So, so thank you very much. Seeing no further questions, thank you, Mr. Thank Olson. you. Thank you. Final question. You represent a company or a group uh, when you when you introduce yourself that would be fine and if you want to tell us what town you're from then uh, you may do that also good afternoon chairman Edgecombe chairman Hickman and distinguished members of the agriculture conservation and forestry committee my name is Bonnie Preston. I live in Blue Hill. Uh, I do represent the Alliance for Democracy in Maine. And I'm here to testify enthusiastically in favor of LD783. Food is life. Our country was founded on the idea that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are inalienable rights. And food is life. LD783 roots us in those things that Mainers have been doing since first settling here. I've seen the Farm Bureau's Legislative Digest, um, that was online a couple days ago, which opposes this bill because of the ambiguity in such words as gathering and foraging. I'm sure those who feed themselves using these methods know exactly what they mean and could teach the rest of us some useful skills. But more importantly, constitutional rights are purposely broadly written. They provide the ground on which we stand in presenting our own interpretations and staking our own claims to do what we believe is right. Legislation can take care of the particulars, and I might add including definitions, and the courts can accept or deny the validity of our positions. Our history is one of moving forward, or backwards as the case may be, based on interpretations of constitutions, state or federal. So let us begin. It was once said of Maine that as Maine goes, so goes the nation. Our motto is, I lead. The nation is now looking for our leadership away from a corporate agriculture that is selling us shrink-wrapped factory meat and highly processed, chemical-laden, food-like substances into a time when we can all eat real food and recapture the true meaning of community. A time when we can feed ourselves and our neighbors unmediated by those who don't know the difference between a snowball and a sour milk chocolate cake. Do yourselves proud and present the whole legislature with a unanimous ought to pass recommendation. Thank you. 
Thank you. Questions for Bonnie? Thank you for your testimony, Bonnie. Thank you. Heather Redford. Followed by Alan Lover, Brian Jones, Jesse Dowling, and Hendrick Green. Good afternoon. My name is Heather Redford. I'm a farmer. I'm a mother. I eat food and I give a whole lot of time and effort into growing food and making food for my family and for my community. I also serve on the board of Food for Maine's Future and work on community governance of local food. There are good reasons why we need the right to food articulated in Maine's constitution. Primarily, Section 25, establishing a right to food, belongs in the Bill of Rights because it is a right so many of us assume what we have, but one that is not recognized by courts and one that is not protected legally. I know Representative Hickman already mentioned the um, three statements that the FDA made in 2010, one of which I want to just repeat, that the assertion of a fundamental right to our own bodily and physical health is unavailing because we don't have um, a fundamental right to obtain any food that we wish. When our bodily and physical health is not legally our own, when the agency that is increasingly controlling more and more of our food supply states that our right to our own health and our right to feed our children and ourselves food of our choosing is not a fundamental right and they prevail in court, people aren't served and our health is not served. LD 783 is an important step to serve people, to protect our right to our bodily health, our right to access foods of our choosing, and to feed our children what we deem is best. Our access to food, our right to life, our right to the founding of life, to seed, is increasingly legally controlled by corporate food monopolies. And when they sue, the law is often on their side. People lose, we lose our access to food, to food integrity, and to our own bodily and physical health. LD 783 gives people standing in court. It gives us legal protection when there are aggressive lawsuits that inhibit our ability to access healthy food or to grow and exchange foods of our choosing. The time has come when we need this articulated and protected under the Constitution. An exciting way forward lies today before this committee. People across the nation are looking to Maine, hopeful that we will continue to lead for food rights. People in California and Wyoming and Virginia and Florida and Wisconsin, Maryland and Kentucky. Remember, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul, little Emily Dickinson, because there's also a lot of poetry and food. But these people across the country are rooting for us because the food sovereignty movement has given them hope. And I think Maine can lead the nation forward by demonstrating its support for the right to food. While the courts have considered the issue of a right to food. Thank you, Heather. Heather, mm -hmm. can you show us what's on the bottom half of your uh, t-shirt? But I can. Food is life. Oh, and then the LD number. Okay. <laughs> Time is now. Okay. Thank you. Any questions uh, for Heather? Thank you for your testimony. Alan Lober. It's good to see uh, Rep. Chapman, Senator Dill, um, Representative Hickman. I remember you from before. And I'm so pleased to see Rep. Hickman in the chairman uh, position. Well deserved, in my opinion. Uh, I'll have to pass. Oh, Alan Loberg, Hope, Maine. Um, I uh, ought to pass. Our historical documents mean what they say. For example, Article 1, Section 8, U.S. Constitution says the federal government has power to regulate interstate commerce, not intrastate commerce. The Declaration of Independence, that these united colonies are, and of a right, ought to be free and independent states, Notice it says they are free. Armed conflict ensued. 
but there was something behind their resolve and willingness to use arms that won this nation its freedom. Local food was the primary reason uh, they won that conflict. <clears throat> no people have ever won a conflict that did not have control over their own food source. The right <laughs> is, uh, that right is under attack today. Our two evil political parties who would change our understanding of the rule of law as clearly written and would subjugate you and the world to big agriculture, their primary political supporters, and make slaves of all of us. The preamble to the main constitution, form ourselves into a free and independent state. Those words seem to carry directly over from the Declaration of Independence. Establish justice. We have seen already, uh, uh, seen there is no justice without the means to enforce it, and the greatest means is local food. Uh, ensure tranquility. Local farmers are the happiest people anywhere in the world, and their zeal is infectious. Provide for the mutual defense. We have already seen that behind the obvious force of arms, the real cause of victory in any conflict is the people's control over a viable local food source promote our common welfare. Farming is a primary occupation, meaning it is a wealth creator and a job creator. It is also uh, promote health care. Secure to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty. We have already seen what words freedom and justice meant historically, and here we see it extends to their posterity. That's you and I. For more context of local food and how it fit into the milieu of Maine at that time, I read from the 1813 Gazetteer of the United States. The section on Maine reads, all the settled parts lie near a market and the produce of the farmer is readily exchanged for money at a good price. Maine became a state just seven years later as part of the Missouri Compromise. The South did not want to fix the slavery issue, but rather wanted to extend it, and in their zeal, fired on Fort Thank you, Alan. Uh, questions from the panel? I'm sorry, 75 more words if you want to conclude it. Okay. Uh, anybody have a question? Well, we have your testimony, and I'll ask the, uh, the uh, committee just to make note that we you didn't have a chance to state those that last uh, six or eight lines that are there. Thank you. Thank you. I, I see no questions, right? Thank you. The Honorable Brian Johnson. I'll get you later. Contrary to custom, uh, unfortunately, the uh, treats for the committee are sitting on the kitchen table. So the good representative from Brooksville suggested that I offer you a double or nothing deal as compensation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, 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 means, that means I'm going to have to bake four dozen cookies, not just two. Yeah. And what uh, the Honorable uh, uh, Representative Jones is referring to, once you serve on a committee in the legislature and you return uh, with testimony to speak with the committee, you owe them a treat. <laughs> this testimony will be a treat. <laughs> we like your humor. <laughs> so, uh, Senator, I just want to represent the members of the committee. We're here to talk about fundamental rights. And a fundamental right is a right that is so important that the government can't infringe upon it without proving so that, that doing so is necessary, and its infringement so narrowly tailored that it achieves a compelling state interest. Now, some fundamental rights are clearly stated in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Others are buried in, in court interpretation of the 14th Amendment's protection to uh, um, um, e e equal protection clause. Since the right to food isn't uh, clearly stated in the Constitution or Bill of Rights, we have to look at how the courts have interpreted the 14th Amendment and derive, uh, determine whether or not we do believe this is a fundamental right that we want to reaffirm with a constitutional amendment. Now, there's several tests of uh, implied rights under the 14th Amendment. 
Um, I refer sp specifically to uh, Washington versus Glucksburg. Uh, the question is, is the right uh, fundamental to the very existence and survival of the race? Is the right so rooted in tradition or conscience of our people as to be ranked fundamental? And has the Supreme Court identified or suggested that or a similar right? Well, here's what the court has said. The court said the freedom of personal choice in matters of family life is a protected fundamental liberty interest. This right denotes the right of the individual to generally enjoy those privileges long recognized at common law as essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness by free men. Controlling the raisings of one's children is a fundamental right. And there is a right to make choices concerning one's health. In fact, no right is held more sacred or is more carefully guarded by the common law than the right of every individual to the possession and control of his own person. The rights to privacy and bodily integrity are also fundamental rights. But some government entities see the right to food as not being a uh, fundamental right, hence our concern and the need for this amendment. Uh, this has been said before, uh, but it bears repeating. The United States Department of Health and Human Services has testified uh, three points, like I said, that have been said before. Um, above mere sustenance, however, people consume for food for a variety of reasons as a part of religious practice or ceremony, as a means of communion with friends, family, or community, as a means of self-expression or cultural expression, a conscious decision to exercise control over one's health, and yes, even as political speech. All of these are fundamental, protected fundamental rights, and that's why this amendment is needed. To guard against government overreach, we must clearly constitutionally codify as a fundamental right that every individual has a right to the, to the food of his or her choosing. And I'd be happy to answer any questions and provide background on the references uh, uh, I've provided in court cases at the work session. Uh, Representative Jones, when our work session comes, we'll vote on that proposal you have for the treat there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that means I'm invited. It's <laughs> uh, Representative Marine has a question for you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Honorable Jones. Thank you. Um, I'm to my left in the 126 for two years, and I need to ask you a question. Were you or were you not my source of common sense while you were here? Uh, quite frankly, I think you were my source of common sense. <laughs> and Representative Jones brought out a, a point about being invited to work sessions. Be it known that anyone in the state of Maine is uh, invited to a work session. The thing is that you may not be asked to speak or answer questions as a prerogative of the uh, chair at the time because we don't like to get into another uh, whole issue of uh, testimony all over again. But sometimes you may have vital information. We feel that you could help us, and we may ask you a specific question. So thank you for that offer. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Jesse Dowling will be next, followed by Hendrick, Denise, Richard King, Heather Spock, Allen. Okay. Good afternoon, Senator Ed Cohn, Representative Hickman, and distinguished members of the Joint Planning Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Jesse Dowling, and I live in Wakefield, Maine. I became a farmer because I was interested in helping people. I was interested in making a difference in this world, and I felt like growing food for people would be the best way to do it. For my first few years doing that, I realized it was really hard, and it was really hard for farmers to make a living. So I went and got a master's in food policy and learned a lot about food sovereignty as a global social movement, and I realized I needed to be a farmer if I was going to actually make a difference. So I've been in Maine for the past nine years making cheese and milking goats and sheep, and I've been running Fuzzy Edder Creamery in Whitefield um, for my second year there, but my fourth year as a business. And I am a licensed cheesemaker, and I am testifying in favor of LB 783. I am not afraid of the repercussions that this bill may make on the licensing industry. I think we're going to be fine, and I think that the right to food is more important than anything else. And I can't believe that we are here today wondering if this is something that we should do. We have to do this. Is next time we're going to say we need the right to air for people to breathe? Is that, is that what we're doing next? Because I feel like it's ridiculous that this isn't already something that is available, right? Um, so I stand in solidarity with all people with the right to produce food and to eat food and trade food in any way that they decide. Um, and I think that it's the right of the people of Maine to decide this. Um, I think the referendum is the right way to go. So thank you. 
Thank you, Jesse. Any questions for Jesse? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Andrew. Give back to Cassie when she comes. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome. Representative Hickman, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I am Hendrick Gideons of Brooklyn, Maine. Uh, I do a lot of environmental stuff and I'm active in the uh, local foods uh, movement. I strongly support uh, LD 783. I was trained a half a century ago as a historian and a philosopher and uh, I did a lot of background reading and then it occurred to me this is an amendment, proposed amendment to the Constitution. Let's look at the record. So I went to the 25 sections of the Declaration of Rights, and by the way, there already are 25. There's one that's a 13A, so this will be the 26th. I read them through several times and grouped them as to purpose. Two of them speak to our natural rights, including those that are not enumerated. Five speak to the basis of our democracy. Two speak to freedom of speech one to freedom of religion, and 15, three-fifths of the whole, speak to protections against arbitrary authority. <laughs> I started thinking about that proportional attention. Maine was still only a few decades away from a revolution based on grievances against arbitrary, non-representative authority, so it's not surprising that the three-fifths ratio was there. Maine was still an agrarian, timbering, trapping, shipbuilding, and fishing community, when it spoke to enjoying and defending life and liberty, its citizens had direct and immediate knowledge of what natural rights might mean in their lives. Jump now from the early 19th century to the early 21st. Our kids, by contrast, don't know where their food comes from. Some might say sardonically, that's a good thing. We could be the breadbasket for New England, you know and yet we import 90% of our food, and we have the highest rate of food insecurity of the, of the New England states. It's time for Maine to declare itself on the right to food, to recognize explicitly that one can't enjoy or defend life and liberty without access to good food and nutrition, and their foundational role in, quote, pursuing and obtaining safety and happiness. Representative Hickman's initiative provides an essential 21st century rendering of a concept of life and liberty still valid today, but which had a more direct and immediate context for citizens of the 19th century and didn't need saying explicitly, it does today. Passing this bill will provide constitutional support for increasing our attention to food and farming. It will foster economic growth, uh, uh, development of a much needed restoration of smaller scale local farming, good for employment, and a hedge against both the causes and consequences of climate destabilization. Include it, specify it, bring the proposition before the voters of Maine, we will vote to accept. Hendrick, help me with my geography. Is that in, is uh, Brooklyn in Washington County? It is in Hancock County. Hancock. It's at the southeast corner of the Blue Hill Peninsula, right across from Dura. Okay, thank you. In my district, center. Oh, All right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question? Yeah. 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 Thank you, Senator. Uh, I appreciate hearing from the public, even uh, from my constituents and those who are not my constituents. So, uh, isn't that so? <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much for having me. Richard King is next, followed by Heather Spaulding, Alan and Johnson. This is a legal question that I can't answer. Whether it is currently is or isn't is not important. It should be. LD 783 makes it a natural and unalienable right in the state of Maine. Buying food, whether from a local farmer or from a supermarket, involves an element of trust. Despite the myriad of regulations and required inspections in the industrial food system, instances of contamination resulting in recalls, illnesses, and death are all too common. 
Yet we are asked, almost forced, to trust the corporate food system. The focus is only on the bottom line. <clears throat> we are appalled by the terrible conditions and the concentrated animal feeding operations, the unseen cruelties that the animals endure, the GMO corn and soy that they are fed, and the use of antibiotics and growth hormones that remain in the food chain and the environment. Do these GMO elements find their way into our food? I would like to see GMO labeling on all products, both food and feed, because my goats are not guinea pigs. We are concerned about the continued overuse of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers that are required to sustain monoculture farming and that are poisoning our land, our water, and us. Direct farm to consumer sales were traditionally unregulated. <clears throat> Going to a local farm to buy fresh food is one of the oldest and most natural commercial activities. Even though I can buy unlimited types and quantities of food from the supermarket, I am much more comfortable knowing where my food comes from and who has produced it. I prefer dealing face to face with someone that I know and trust. LD 783 is a major step forward toward food sovereignty in the state of Maine and I sincerely hope that it is allowed to be put before the people so that we can decide to make it a constitutional right. My wife couldn't be here, but she says Jean Dobry, and I can't speak with her Polish accent, but I'll read two of her words. It is our duty to protect ourselves, even if against the law, by taking the right to save seeds, to grow, raise, and consume nourishing natural foods of the earth, and exercising the right to refuse depleted, toxic, manufactured commodities. It must be our right to produce food from hunters, excuse me, to purchase food from hunters, fishermen, and farmers, and to shun agribusiness. Food that harms is not food. The law that allows harm is not.